Moses said to God, I'm not able to carry all these people alone, for they are too heavy for me. Please be seated. Well, as we are reading the lessons last night at the 5 o'clock service, it dawned on me that I had a really bad sermon plan. <laughs> so I didn't use it, and I'm not going to use it for you here at the 10 o'clock. So we'll see how this goes, because I was struck by the lessons, particularly the Old Testament lesson, and how it may have great meaning for you during this time. It's been an exciting week at St. Paul's. You were here last week, you heard the announcement. If you weren't here, you should have gotten an email or something in the mail telling you that you have called the Reverend Paul Kane to be your next rector. Very exciting time for you guys and a very strange time for me, I must say. I started the staff meeting this week with a picture up on the screen of a, of a duck on crutches. <laughs> it had a little clergy collar on, you know, so your lame duck rector last year. <laughs> but it also gives me some freedom, right? Because what can you do to me now? I only have a few more weeks anyway. So speaking of rabble, <laughs> I do want to focus on this Old Testament lesson and see perhaps it has something to say to you during this transition time and this exciting time, this new era here at St. Paul's. Because this Old Testament lesson, I really love that Drew read it too because she does such a great job kind of putting us into the story. Uh, and you could just hear some of the emotion coming out because Moses is done, isn't he? He has just had it. The story begins with the rabble rousers in the camp complaining about the food situation. And the Israelites join in with them as well. And you, you heard this great description of how wonderful their meals were when they were in Egypt. Do you believe a minute of that, that they had m melons and cucumbers and spices galore? You know, we have selective memory, I think, sometimes about how the good old days were, right? You ever look back on that and maybe not quite remember accurately what the good old days were? Well, like, I think that's going on with these folks here. It's not the first time that they've murmured in the wilderness. It won't be the last time. It's not the first or last time that Moses complains about it to God. But in this instance, Moses, he is just burnt out, isn't he? He says, God, just kill me and take me away from this burden that you have given me. Quite a, a big statement for a leader of the people to make. This is Moses, right? He is the greatest hero in the history of the Hebrew people. Right, he was the baby in the basket that was rescued by Pharaoh's daughter. He grew up to be a powerful leader in Egypt. Then he murders an Egyptian, and he has to run and hide, and that's when he encounters the burning bush right, out in the desert, and God sends him, even though he's reluctant, to go back to Pharaoh and save the people from slavery and lead them out into the wilderness. And we must not forget why that happened. Because God's plan was for these, this little tribe of people to be the message bearers to the world, to separate themselves from the rest of the world, to be different, to be holy, to observe the commandments and laws that God has given. And they're formed as a nation in that wilderness, and it looks like at this point they're not going to make it. You ever wonder what God's plan B was? I wonder about that all the time, right? But God sticks with them, and Moses he just can't take any more of it. All they've done is complain. All I've done is do what God asked me to do. So God doesn't throw a lightning bolt down from Mount Sinai to take Moses out. Instead, God offers Moses a better way. He offers Moses some help. Now, I'm not Moses, and neither is Paul Cain. You're not rabble either, so don't get too far into the story thinking of yourselves in that way, but this is the key piece to it. God realizes that Moses, as their leader, cannot do it all alone. And so God sends the 70 elders to gather at the tent of meeting. That's their church. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was inside that tent. So if they were going to come and worship, that's where they would come. So these 70 elders come and gather at church, and it says that God put some of the spirit that was on Moses upon them. What do you think about that? You know, let's share this Holy Spirit with these elders, Moses. It's not just for you to do these things. And you know what happens next? It says that the 70 began to prophesy. So when you hear that word, prophesy, or prophecy in the Bible, what do you think of? What do you think that means? You can answer. What do you Speak out. Speaking in tongues, we hear it that way. Speaking about the future. Exactly. Most of the time in our 21st century years when we hear prophecy, we're thinking of fortune telling. 
are people who have been given a special gift to predict or to announce what's going to happen. But did you know that 93% of the time in the Bible, when the word prophecy is used, it has nothing to do with telling the future. Literally, the word means to speak on behalf of God or to act on behalf of God. Moses had been the one doing that all this time. And God gathers these elders, and now they're giving, given some of that spirit to speak on behalf of God as well. In the New Testament, St. Paul talks about spiritual gifts, and I'm going to have more to say about that in a moment. But one of those spiritual gifts is the gift of prophecy. And he did not mean the gift of someone who's going to predict the future. He meant people that will preach and speak on behalf of God. And if you think about all the prophets in the Old Testament, most of what they, they did was go and challenge the powers that be, speak truth to power, that God asked them or told them, go to this king or this priest and say these difficult words and speak truth to them. So the people of Israel needed some truth, didn't they? And they didn't need to just hear it from Moses. Moses needed some help. So God gives that spirit and that prophecy and that truth to these elders to also join with them. What a difference that must have made, don't you think, in the camp. It's not just about this leader that we're grumbling about. All of these are telling us the same thing and speaking the truth to us. Now, at the end of that little section, there's an interesting phrase that says, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. And that's the end of that. We don't know why. Why did they not prophesy anymore after that? The Hebrew literally means they ceased prophesying at that point in time. But there's no explanation for that. So we're not really sure of what happened there. But we do know there were two other guys in the camp, Eldad and Medad. And it says that they were outside of the tent of meeting. They were somewhere else. They didn't join at the church. They didn't come into the doors. Yet they were also given some of the spirit that Moses was given. And they also began to prophesy. And it doesn't say that they ceased prophesying. Think about what that could mean to you. That we're called to speak the truth, but not just inside these walls. You're called to be out into your community, speaking truth to power, speaking and acting on behalf of God. You know how God wants you to do those things. And this is a church, my friends, that does know that. One of the things I've been so most impressed by you is how engaged you are in your community, whether it's right around here or if it's in Haiti or, or other places like that. You are a church that understands what it means to serve others with your hands and your feet and your, and your mouth outside of the front of the tent of meeting. You know you have to do that. I want to encourage you to remember that lesson and keep doing it. Because the truth is, you need to be something special for Paul Cain when he arrives as your rector. I want you to think about it this way. Can you be the 70 for him? Can you recognize that no rector, no priest can do all this by themselves? There are things that he will do as your leader, obviously. Sacramental things and preaching and teaching. And all the CEO stuff that rectors have to do that we don't like very much. But that's part of the job, and he knows that well. But he cannot make you the church that you can be, the potential that you can live into in this community by himself. And when I think of Eldad and Medad, you know, their names were not on the letterhead, right? They weren't on the vestry. They weren't on the staff. There were two people out here in the camp who also got some of that spirit and began to prophesy and speak the truth. Now, when I hear about the Spirit being put upon people, it always makes me think of baptism, right? We believe at baptism that the Holy Spirit comes upon us, and we are not the same as we were before we approach that font when we leave it. And the Bible is very clear that it says, every one of you has been given gifts by God, spiritual gifts. And if you don't use them, you're going to be a very frustrated person. There's no greater joy than learning what your gifts are and using them in, in the cause of Christ here in this community and in this church. Now, I don't know what your gifts are. You have to find that out. But you will know it when you exercise those gifts. Each of those 70 had a different gift, I believe, a different prophecy, a different way to speak and act for God, as do you. So it's up to you to be the 70, to stand up, but don't cease prophesying like the elders did in this instance. Jesus helps us with that piece of it. In the beginning of the gospel passage, the disciple John comes to Jesus and said, there's some people out there that are healing and casting out demons in your name, and they're not part of us. What does Jesus say? So? <laughs> so? 
anyone who is doing this in my name is with us. Those who are not against us are with us, Jesus says. Sometimes we have to think outside the box. Sometimes we have to step into our spiritual gifts and not wait for someone to invite us to do that. You have the gifts, you have the power, you have the capability of doing all of those things. You know, the purpose of a church sometimes gets muddled. We live in such a consumer-driven society, don't we? And, and often we think, well, I'm going to go to this church or that church because it can do something for me. You know, I have this program that I like or for my kids or whatever. And that's great that churches can do that. And we try to, our best to offer things like that here. But the purpose of church is for you to come here in the tent of meeting and worship a holy God and to be fed by the body and blood of Christ. And then to learn how to be the best disciples of Christ that you can be. And lastly, of course, you are sent out to do the work you've been given to do, to be the 70 for this church and for this community. At the end of this passage, when Moses is fussing at Joshua about his complaining about Eldad and Medad, Moses says, would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord will put his spirit on them. The Lord has put his spirit on you. So be the 70. Amen.